Okay, so yeah, thank, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Michael. I'm the uh, I lead strategy and customer development at Poly AI. Um, I'm joined by my colleague Nathan, who's our senior product manager, and we're here to talk to you about building great voice experiences. Um, so for those that haven't had a chance to check out our website, um, Poly, we're Poly AI. We build custom voice assistants for superhuman customer service over the phone. Um, so we're really passionate about building the most engaging voice assistants that understand callers, regardless of accents, dialects, digressions, and even language. And you know what I've personally found interesting is the voice AI community online is just always so vibrant. You know, it's all over my Twitter, my LinkedIn, my Clubhouse. Um, so as part of Poly AI, you know, we've been launching voice assistants for a couple of years now, and so uh, with our own NLU models, and uh, we just really want to take this opportunity to talk about how we design and view great voice experiences uh, for our clients. So without much further ado, Nathan, why don't you kick us off? Um, if you could give us a brief introduction to yourself, uh, what you do day to day at Poly and how you fell into, into conversational design and then we'll get on with your slides. You're on mute, Nathan, classic. <laughs> that was a great start, of course, that was good. Um, hi. Um, I'm Nathan, as Michael said, I'm a product manager here at Poly AI. Um, I have been here for, for nearly two years now. So while I'm not a conversation designer by trade, um, I have listened to maybe more, more customer calls than anyone else at the company. Um, so uh, I've been spending the last couple of years really working with the technical team to use their technical prowess and our experience with, with customer centric design to build um, to build voice assistants, which are actually enjoyable to use. So we can start uh, conversational design. So what is conversational design? Well, um, it's many things. I can go through a long list. It's it's using verbal ticks, it's grammar, um, it's latency, it's the voice actor disclosing your an agent, buttons and cards, phrasing the agent's name, background noise, many things. We think all of them are important. A tiny grammatical mistake or a slightly unnatural turn of phrase can suddenly make a, a natural conversation feel very jarring or robotic. Latency is a balance between not rushing the customer and also being natural um, and human. And we train our voice actors extensively. We obsess over the phrasing we use. And we've recently developed technology to do things like interject with hums and ahs in the middle of customer speech to make the conversation feel really, really human. But while we could probably do a presentation on every single one of these things, focusing on one doesn't necessarily make good design. And you can probably read many articles online about all of these different things. You could follow every single best practice. You could do these things perfectly and still be left with a virtual agent, which is not very good, either too robotic or too uncanny. And especially when we're poly AI and we work across domains and across languages, we know that each of our clients and every user has a different thing that's important to them too. So we thought we'd break it down into uh, four, four more broad topics, four different things that we do in every conversation. So how we ask a user a question, how we give answers to the questions, the way we go about recording prompts, um, and finally, a few um, considerations for what happens if we maybe become too good. And we're going to relate all of these to examples that are real use cases for us. So we haven't pulled these out of thin air. These are real things that we've done um, in the past, in travel and hospitality, in telcos and troubleshooting, um, and in banking. And these icons will be in the bottom of the screen at all times. So you can kind of see what type of industry we're talking about um, at every point. So yeah, let's start with some examples um, about asking questions. I'm going to go through a few different examples, and um, Michael is, I think, uh, probably will have some more for me as well. So let's start with um, how we ask questions. So our main goal when we ask a user a question in a conversational agent on the phone is we want to gently encourage the user to give the answer that we expect. Because natural language understanding is really good, our accuracy is really high, but it's not perfect. So we want to limit the amount of things the customer can say while still making the user feel like they can say anything. So we don't want to be too broad. A question like this, what is the issue with your broken phone in a troubleshooting scenario? The user here is incentivized to tell a long rambling story. And if the user starts, starts saying things that we can't predict, 
then they're just going to get frustrated when we can't answer it. We can't cater for every single issue with a broken phone. We can't cater for the way everybody's going to say that their problem. So we want to be a little bit more restrictive. But we don't want to be too restrictive. So for sure, you may have phoned up many conversational assistants in the past and they've said answering yes or no and then then set a question. But we don't want to do this. Asking a restrictive question means that we're going to end up in a long, winding, yes and no robotic conversation. Is the screen cracked? Does the screen turn on? Does your phone charge? And no, nobody wants to be stuck on the phone for too long. So at Poly AI, we, we try and limit input while still allowing natural responses. So something like this, what part of your phone is broken? We can predict the, the amount of things um, a customer can say to this. We can predict most answers to this question. Um, and yet it's still quite an open question. So the customer's free to talk in a complete sentence um, as well. Yes, yeah, so I guess the, the, the comment here is, and what, and what strikes me about this example is that it's a particular challenge to, to voice assistance, right? So I imagine there's many people in the audience that have experience building um, text chatbots. Um, but what I find is with a text chatbot, you've got far more flexibility in that user interface, right? You can add lists, you can add sort of things for people to click on to clarify their intent. Uh, you could even you know, insert pictures um, if they're on their phone. But, but with voice, you do have to be very intentional right with with the way that you're designing this um yeah i just thought i'd sort of make that comment here yeah. yeah no exactly i mean if many many chatbot building companies who build for chat they might go for the first option and give the user a, a set of buttons to press with a set of options but then if they they translate their chat agent to a voice agent then suddenly that voice agent is not going to be very good because the user doesn't know the options that uh, they can say so um that's why at least we think voice first is the way to do things um, um, in general. Yeah. Um, one more comment before we move on. Um, I know a couple of um, new people have just joined. So I just want to call out um, as we're going through this presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them into to the Q&A and, and we'll get to them um, yeah, throughout the course of the presentation. Cool. Cool. Um, another, another great uh, trick we do is um, avoiding asking a question at the beginning of a prompt. So in this scenario, we have asked the user when they would like to book and then given some information. And this is frustrating for a user as they might have forgotten the question by the time they've received the information. Or even worse, they might try and talk over us. They might immediately try and answer the question and then speak over the important information that they'll need to pay a deposit. And later when they hear that, they'll get frustrated that they weren't told sooner. So moving the question to the end of a prompt is a really simple way to make the agent both more approachable and also make sure the customer hears what they need to hear before asking the question. That being said, in many cases, the customer is not going to know the answer to the question. And we need to cater for confused users. So if a user is silent, for example, in this scenario, we've just repeated the same prompt. What flight class shall I book? What flight class shall I book? And there are many reasons why someone might have been silent. They could be confused. They could not understand the question. They could not know the options. So instead, we need to, what we call, narrow the focus. So we ask a broad conversational question. And then if the user's confused, we then offer them some alternatives that they can say. But you might ask, why not just ask the longer, clearer question of, would you like to book economy business or first? First, well, this then makes the conversation feel more restrictive. Most people will know the answer to the first question and it's more conversational. But also if we ask, if we provide options immediately, then the customer doesn't know what else they can say at that point. And if they don't want any of the three options, they might hang up. They might not know they can ask an FAQ at this point in the conversation. So we always want to be as open as possible until the user um, really needs some extra information. So we avoid repeating ourselves for high volume questions and we prioritize being conversational. We also don't want to tell the user how to speak. So we don't want to sound like a robot. We don't want to sound like a keyword recognizer. So to be conversational, we don't want to give strict instructions like you can say make a payment or you can say change amount. We want to ask a natural question and then allow the user to say other things as well. 
So if a user gets a list of prompts that they can say, then if they want to say something else, they're much more likely to hang up and we're much less likely to contain the call. If we ask an open question, do you want to make a new payment or change something? The users are more free to use natural language or ask a follow-up. And all of this builds trust and confidence with the user, which is really important. And it's important in a case like this, we've asked a user when they would like to come in for a booking and the user said tomorrow and we've confirmed that we've booked it. But many users don't trust voice assistants, so they're probably not gonna be sure in this case that we've really understood them. They've booked their table or their hotel room, but, but they're not sure if we've got it right. So we can take the opportunity to build confidence with the user by repeating back some of the user's input in our answer. So, okay, I've booked you in for tomorrow. Is there anything else I can help you with? And trust is most important when we're giving the user information um, we want them to hear, like answering their questions. So uh, our goal when giving answers is not to overwhelm the user. So um, if they were to ask a question, like when do you close tomorrow? We don't want to list all of the opening times. Maybe you'll be able to do this in a chat-based system, but on voice, it's too much information in one go. Um, and the user's probably going to get lost calculating when, if the restaurant is going to be open, for example, at the time that they have requested. So we want to just be direct. When do you close tomorrow? Well, tomorrow we close at 10 p.m. And then again, we've repeated some of the customer's requests there as well to make sure that they know they're getting the right answer. Yeah, I mean, the example here on the left, I mean, it's fairly obvious that, that it's, a, it's not the ideal experience for, for this utterance, right? But, but I can see the appeal from the development perspective, like having been on that side somewhat um, in the past, because you're essentially just bundling in all the opening times, right, into a single intent, um, rather than having to separate them out and, and you know, create different, I guess, intent pairings for like, you know, weekdays versus weekends, or maybe in some instances, you know, it's even more complex, like the one you've outlined, like Mondays and Tuesdays versus Wednesdays, to Fridays versus weekends. I, I can see how that would add a lot of complexity in the background. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So most, most companies wouldn't have the resource. Um, in fact, we wouldn't have the resource to train a hundred different intents on all the different things someone could ask about opening times. So in this case, this is something we really do. Uh, we have a few intents about opening and closing times, and then we use a value extraction to pick out the entity that's tomorrow to give a specific answer there as well. So um, there are technical challenges. It's not it's not always just a common sense thing. Sometimes it's what's possible and what's not. Um, we must always, as I said before, uh, carry the context of of some of the user's question into the answer. So. Um, sometimes maybe the third party speech recognition platform that we use gives us some, some fuzzy input. So if a user says, how much did I pay my landlord this month? Maybe they said, how much did I pay my landlord last month? And then if we answer direct too directly, you spent 1,500 pounds, then maybe, maybe they've received wrong information and they will never know they've received wrong information. Maybe they'll double pay their rent. So again, carrying some of some of the user's question into the answer makes the experience much more, uh, it makes it natural and also builds confidence with the user. You spent uh, one and a half thousand pounds on rent this month. That being said, we don't wanna to be too direct because if we're too direct, then conversations can be clunky. So in this case, if a user is silent, uh, we don't want to respond with, of course. Um, but of course might be hard coded into an FAQ answer or into the system in some way. But if we hard code these prefixes, um, then we don't take into account all the different ways an utterance, utterance can be triggered by the system. So removing, removing yeses and nos and of courses and sure and thank you from the beginning of utterances is um, a way to keep the conversation uh, succinct as well. We also want to hint at the, the scope of the answer that we're giving. So here a user is inquiring about available flights and we've given them this information. I have a flight to Belgrade at 6 p.m. for 58 pounds. 
And this is a bad prompt as it suggests there's only one flight available. If the user doesn't want this flight, they might hang up. They might ask for a cheaper one or a later one, but we don't have a cheaper one or a later one. So we could provide some more information. But this is also a bad prompt as it's, it's too much information to pass over voice. Maybe it'll be okay with a chat, but over the telephone, you're gonna get confused with three different times, three different dates and three different prices. Instead here, I have three flights to Belgrade tomorrow and the cheapest one is at 6 p.m. for 58 pounds. It provides um, the, it provides the most relevant option. It tells the user how many flights they have. And it also says the relation between these flights. This means if a user asks for another flight, they know that the other flight is going to be more expensive and they're more likely to have a better experience as the conversation goes on. And finally, once more, we still repeat part of the user's inquiry tomorrow in, inside the answer uh, to make sure that our answer is complete um, and detailed and yet still brief and precise. Sometimes we won't understand the user though, so we have to give answers um, when we're wrong as well. So um, in this case, the user has asked, um, they, want to, they want to send 50 pounds, but maybe the speech recognition service has given us, I want to mend 50 clowns, which uh, clearly we can't handle. Um, I'm not sure what use case we'll need to get into to, to need to handle that. But um, in this case, we don't want to blame the user for, for um, some fuzzy input. So telling the user to speak clearer, saying we didn't understand, the user's just going to get frustrated and maybe try and rephrase in a way that that is even more difficult for us. So instead, we should not dwell on mistakes. We don't even have to tell the user we didn't understand. We should just move on, apologize, ask the user to repeat. Um, sorry, how much would you like to transfer? And the user is much more likely to forget about that, that very short, um, imperfect experience. Yeah, I really wanted to come up with a joke here, but but I've, it, my brain has failed me. Um, but, but I love this example because it, it shows you what actually happens behind the scenes with, with speech recognition, right? Like I, I think uh, at Poly, at least, we talk a lot about noisy transcripts. And, and I guess that's what a noisy transcript looks like in, in the back end for the systems. Um, and uh, that's why, you know, that's a common challenge we see with just using and taking off the shelf speech recognition for voice. Um, because, you know, the, the Best, as, much, as good as those solutions are, you know, these things still happen. And what we see as being far more effective is, is if you're able to combine off-the-shelf components with a level of I, I guess, ASR biasing, I don't know if that's a technical term, or pre- and post-processing is other things that we've heard, um, apply that to off-the-shelf um, speech recognition um, you know, that, that you might get from a Google or, or an Amazon um, to, to get far better results. Yeah, so I mean, you're right. Another another way we could avoid this entirely is by we know that in this case the user is likely to be talking about pounds because it's a banking a banking bot in the UK. So we could we could bias the speech recognition to to listen for pounds and then and then we would never even have got to this this problem in the first place. But because we're not right 100% of the time, most of the time, but not 100%, um, we need to be very sure um, about permanent actions too. So if a user's doing something big, like canceling a booking, then we don't just want to confirm that immediately. We want to give the user a chance to change their mind. Um, give, maybe give them some information. You might lose your deposit. Are you sure you want to cancel? Um, and then they can change their mind. And also it's really important after they've changed their mind to confirm the state of, of the conversation. So in this case, they're making a flight booking. And at the end, we're saying, sure, your flight is still booked. We don't want a user to be left at the end of the conversation hanging or not 100% sure um, about the status of their booking or the status of their transaction. Um, that's just going to have them phoning back or asking to speak to a human. And hopefully when we do all of these things right, then we'll be better and we'll be more human. But we think nothing is more human than a convincing human voice actor. So we spend a lot of effort directing and coaching um, our voice actors. So we've got some examples here. Um, we asked a voice actor to, to record some examples for us. So um, these, some of them maybe are not the best illustrations, but they hopefully will give the idea of, of, of what we do, um, some of the issues that we face and how we try and mitigate them. So firstly, we want our actors to be really clear and precise, but we don't want them to be too formal or too casual. 
if they're too formal, then they may sound robotic. Break. I have a table for two tomorrow at 9 p.m. What is the name I should reserve the booking under? But too casual and they might sound rude. Great, I have a table for two tomorrow at nine. What's your name? So we need to balance warm, conversational um, and polite. I have a table for two people tomorrow at 9 p.m. What's the best name for me to use? A great trick for this is to ask um, voice actors when they're reading something long or a lot of information in one go to imagine it's their first time. We don't want voice actors to sound like they're reading a script. We want to sound like they're somebody in a call center. They want, we want them to sound like they're your best call center agent. We want them to sound like they're thinking from the top of their head. So someone who sounds rehearsed can sound very robotic and very fake. Okay. We have a train station that's a five minute walk away. They're quite frequent. The, the agent should sound like they're thinking. They should sound like it's their first time. And this is actually an example from a real live deployment. Of course, we're just a few miles from the strip and there are city shuttles, buses, uh, our doorman will help you with a taxi or the bell desk can book you a limousine. And to make sure we get the right response from users, we also wanna make sure that questions are properly emphasized. It's very easy for questions to get lost in a longer prompt that might contain information as well. There will be a 15 pound deposit for that. How do you want to pay? So we emphasize clearly what the user should say next. There will be a 15 pound deposit for that. How do you want to pay? And of course, on top of all of this, we need to make sure we get the right person in the first place. We don't want to send off a lot of prompts to a voice actor and get back this. Thank you for calling Beefy to the Duck. When would you like to come in? We definitely don't want to get back this. Thank you for calling Beef Eater the Duck. When would you like to come in? Maybe we don't want to get by that. <laughs> I mean, it, call, it all comes down to, to getting the right voice, right? To, to fit the brand and, and the use case I mean, at the end of the day. But it seems like um, it is quite an art to this uh, that, that is maybe often overlooked. Um, but, but what I find is we're getting to that point where I think the voice actor does significantly change the experience, right, for, for, for the caller. Um, I, these days now, if I, if I hear an overly synthetic voice or, or a poor concatenation, um, maybe it's because I'm working this field, but I really like, hear it um, on, on the phone these days. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we, we of course, work with all of our clients to, to pick the right person. So we'll try and understand uh, their brand standards, probably call the call centre, see how their agents um, do things, and then we'll, we'll provide some options and then work really hard to direct them to, to really represent the brand in the best way um, that everybody's happy with. We, of course, though, don't want to be too real as uh, Virtual agents who are too real can be deceptive. So especially as we get into industries like banking, we have to pay some attention to the ethics of what we do too. Um, and many of these things I'm gonna go through, uh, they're thinking points and talking points, they're up for debate. Um, we really want great UX and we need to set, set good boundaries around what's really natural and really human and also um, the right thing for our clients. So it's really worth being aware of what happens when someone thinks we are human, which does occasionally happen. So there's some good things. So a human, a user who thinks we're human is more likely to talk to us in a complete sentence, which is better for our natural language understanding technology. But at the same time, um, a user could get upset if we're, we don't answer a question particularly clearly or accurately, and they think we're a human who's maybe being obnoxious or just not very knowledgeable. Uh, the UX and the design is, is generally better but we don't want to talk inappropriately to a sensitive category like a child who might phone us. The experience when it's human is more like the one that loyal customers expect, especially if we've worked really closely with the brand um, and we've got the brand voice really right, then um, a loyal customer is, is more likely to like a human agent who sounds like the humans they've spoken to before. Um, but a user might have too high expectations and that might make, make it really difficult to have a natural um, conversation with users trust us more, which is, is great, but also um, if they trust us too much, then again, the expectations might be, might be slightly too high. 
So there are many ways that we, we get around this and we work to get around this. So we want to disclose that uh, we're not human, but we don't want to ruin the experience. So many ways that people have done this in the past um, is with auditory cues, the way they phrase handoff utterances, and the answers to small talk questions. So I'm going to go through these. So auditory cues um, are sounds to signal that a virtual agent has started or finished listening. Um, these are good for signaling that we're processing a request when it takes a few seconds. Um, but beeps to do this, we think, is a generally quite an old fashioned way of doing this um, and isn't the way forward. Um, but here's an example of what that might sound like. I'm Claire, your digital host. How can I help you today? Can I book a table for two people tomorrow? OK, checking for two people. So there, it's clear we're not human. It's precise, it can reduce latency, but it's also not natural and we don't believe it's the future. Um, but that being said, if we make these auditory cues very human, then it can get uncanny. I'm Claire, your digital host. How can I help you today? Can I book a table for two people tomorrow? Um, okay, checking for two people. So we need to find a balance between these two. Um, and our technical team has done a really good job to um, improve latency itself and reduce many of much of the necessity for these cues um, as well. So there's, there's a balance there to find uh, that we're working very hard on. We also want to carefully phrase um, how we, what we say when we hand off to a human. So when a user says something that we can't handle or that requires a handoff, and we can use that opportunity to fulfill the responsibility to disclose that we are uh, not a human. So I'll transfer you to someone who can help, or I'll see if one of my human colleagues is available. That sets the user's expectation, I think, really nicely. And it does it when it's relevant as well. And finally, um, we must give truthful answers to small talk questions, such as who are you or are you a robot, which is actually a fairly common thing that people do ask many of our agents. Um, this allows us to meet our ethical responsibilities, but it doesn't degrade the user experience. We can still start a call with, how can I help? And when a user is confused or silent or asks us, then we can reveal that we, we're digital and everyone's um, on the same page there. So, I mean, there are plenty of gray areas here. There's um, much more to talk about, about the ethics of, of what we do. Um, but as we start dealing with vulnerable customers at banks, I think we are we start to be really aware of the decisions we make throughout the design process. So I uh, asked at the beginning, what is good design? Um, it's subjective, but I think Poly AI um, as a team has become much better at this over the past year. Um, we've been exposed to so many real customers, um, now millions of calls a year um, in many different domains, many different countries. So we're starting to learn cultural differences with our expansion to the US. Um, we're learning new ways to engage customers with our technology, customers who are technical, customers who aren't technical. And if we ask the right questions, we contain more calls. If we give the right answers, we please customers. If we train our voice search as well, our UX is really good. And that focus on ethics as well makes us, I think, a really great culture fit for many companies who are new to this um, and are very wary of what their customers will think. Um, so yeah, that, that's all. And I'll, I'll let Michael um, go through the questions that I see. Yeah, yeah. great. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Um, so, I mean, going back to that, uh, the slide on, on handoffs, right? I, I imagine this is a particularly sort of important topic for our deployments. Um, how, how do you decide when is the right point um, to hand off um, a, a caller to, to a call center agent or um, how aggressive, if you know, that's the right word, that the how, how bot should be in trying to convince the caller to engage so i mean we can do this as technology allows us to to make this decision on a term by term basis so depending on where, where they are in the conversation so sometimes sometimes we'll decide to hand off because the user asks us directly sometimes maybe we won't understand them two times in a row so we'll we'll hand them off um, but maybe there's a point in the conversation or a particular sensitive conversation topic um, where we'll, we'll hand a user off very quickly once we detect maybe that they're, they're either, they really do need a human or they're frustrated or we've misunderstood them once at a sensitive part of the conversation. Um, 
generally uh, we have a set of a set of rules for handing off to a human um, a set of parameters in each transaction which if a user hits then um, then we uh, hand we hand them off for uh, yeah it's really it's really up to each use case yeah I can imagine that different enterprises will have different um, different preferences uh, for for yeah, depending on their brand voice um, another sort of related question to that is uh, that's come through and again you know if um, I encourage the participants check out the Q&A box if you want to drop in your questions um, how long do we normally allow for silence uh, before the bot should sort of reprompt the caller what's a good experience so, there I and mean, once again this is completely configurable we find that um often if within a few seconds if the user hasn't responded they probably haven't responded for a reason um, on a call especially in transactions when the user want, wants to get something done they want to get a table booking done they want to execute a payment um then it's unlikely that they're going to be in silence for no reason so um again it's configurable uh keeping it keeping it too short might might interrupt a user if it's too long then um then the user might maybe have not heard the first question and it'll be frustrating for them because they're waiting to hear it again uh, but we yeah generally a few seconds but it's configurable a user can of course always ask us to repeat the question as well and of course all our agents asking to repeat will, will repeat the question yeah, I mean, th this happens to to me a bit where you know, m maybe I'm pausing, I'm thinking about it, and then the, the bot jumps back in, repeats or reprompts me. Um, what, what are some best practices around that that barge in? I guess that's this term barge in scenario, right? Um, what happens when 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 a bot barges in? You know, is it about uh, if a, allowing a customer to talk over it, or or do you? Um, yeah, to repeat the, the, the prompt despite the barge in from, from the caller. So, I mean, this is a technology that we've built. Um, we've used it in some of our deployments in the past. We've turned it on and off depending on, depending on um, how, how it feels in each use case. Um, we allow a customer to interrupt the agent while they're talking. Um, there are many ways where this might not work. And the reasons we, we don't do it in all our projects is because Maybe a customer is asking a friend for a clarification. Maybe we've asked them, what time would you like to book for? And they're checking with their friend who's standing, sitting next to them. And they'll end up interrupting us and then missing a question. We also, um, I think in one of the examples I gave about asking a question at the end of a prompt instead of at the beginning of a prompt um, is quite important. Because if we ask a question too early, a user interrupts and barges in, then they might we might cut off the prompt before we've given them vital information. So um, again, I believe this is configurable on like term by term basis. So in some parts of the conversation, we can allow people to interrupt, but if we really need to give them some important information, uh, we won't. Um, and in terms of us interrupting the customer, um, that's very unlikely to happen if there's if there's consistent noise coming in to the phone line. We're not we're not going to start speaking. Um, so, so yeah, I, I mean, again, the answers to a lot of these questions are it, it's configurable, but uh, we, we tend to look at each different use case on its own and see how our customers responding to the agent. Are a lot of customers interrupting or yeah. are, have we started interrupting customers for some reason? And how do we go about yeah. fixing that for that particular client? And I guess you can bundle a lot of these questions that are coming through around um, I mean, these are all very small, what seem like small design decisions that you have to make along the way, right? Um, that may not be evident at the start of your journey, right? That you have to make all of these, um, these sort of decisions. Um, maybe you could talk just very quickly about what, what's that process um, that you go through, Nathan, to, to engage uh, you know, our clients um, to surface these? You know, how, how do you raise awareness about these design decisions in the process? So, I mean, we, we tend to start these discussions really early on. So um, one of the main things we hear um, in the late, the late sales process is, is customers, clients who are very wary of their brand standards. So often they'll send us a document, which might be the brand standards document, or um, tell us about their current voice actor for their IVR, or 
maybe a, a particularly good call center agent or maybe send us some call recordings from their Google center agent. And that starts to give a really good idea of what, what the customers expect um, from a voice assistant. And then, then we, we do the build, of course, closely with, with the client. And after that, we go through a fine tuning phase, which really is where we, for the first time, get to hear how that client's customers are inter interacting with our agents. And that's, that's, I think, the best part of most people at PolyAI's job is to hear, hear the real people touching our, our system um, for the first time for a new project. Um, and that's where we start making tweaks to everything from the phrasing of, of the questions to some, some conversation flows. If we know that people are going in certain loops or, or asking questions which we didn't expect to be high volume, but are high volume, that's all when we'll begin tweaking, tweaking these different things as well. Um, and we'll always as well have voice actor sessions booked for after launch. So it's not, we don't record everything in one go and, and, and set a project off into, into, into the world on its own. We'll always make sure that we can constantly iterate on everything that the, uh, everything that's uh, uh, happening in the real world as opposed to just start testing. And it strikes me that the, the act of releasing that voice agent, I guess, to, to user testing can be quite like a, a nerve wracking um, experience, particularly with um, enterprises who may have tried with you know, automation with IVRs and, and this like before. Um, what are your sort of recommendations uh, typically around how robust should the solution be? Um, how accurate does the voice assistant need to be before that first hint of user testing? So I think we always, we tend to go through a testing process with, with, for example, the customers, the clients call center agents themselves. And that gives us a really good idea of how robust we are, are going to be on day one. And it helps uh, catch the majority of, of likely edge cases that we're going to hit in production. Um, very quickly though, customers are very different from every tester. So uh, we always will encounter certain conversation flows, which we didn't expect. But fortunately, the team is very, very fast at, um, at making the relevant changes to, to cater for anything, anything that might, um, might be unexpected. We, are, we will never launch a system without it being as absolutely robust as, as we think it could be based on our knowledge, but of course our knowledge changes very quickly. Um, but we, we see improvements of anywhere between a 20% a to a 50% um, increase in success rates within like the first week. And that's, that's, that's very normal. Yeah, yeah, cool. real, real, real people are very surprising um, and, and very difficult. So yeah, yeah it's always, yeah. always eye-opening to hear the real calls. Uh, yeah, it is, it is difficult to, I mean, everyone says, put, your shoe, put yourself in the shoes of your customer. It is difficult to think of actually the exact words they might use <laughs> to, to, to make a request um, without hearing it for yourself first. Um, or especially in, I mean, over the past year with, with um, the pandemic, none, none of our systems were built specifically with the pandemic in mind. So of course, this is the type of thing where customers suddenly their behavior changes, the questions they ask, the way they ask things, the sized groups they might be booking for, um, they might be more cautious about booking a hotel or something. So um, this is a, a prime example of somewhere where we're, we're very robust, but we will make changes based on new information and uh, new situations. Yeah, I mean, maybe let's take a short detour there to, to that, to the pandemic situation. Um, I mean, yeah, like how, how was that, um, what was that process, right? How, how, how did we adapt our, our solutions for our clients? You know, what was that process? How long did it take? If you could, yeah, outline this for, for the audience quickly. I mean, uh, without, without giving two specific examples, very quickly um, in in 2020, it became clear that customers were suddenly very concerned about about anything that involved leaving the house, even before um, even before like we had lockdowns in in the UK. So this is when having agents that represented brand standards and had polite and warm uh, polite and warm voice actors. Um, and careful and polite phrasing was really important because maybe something that we had built that might have been a bit cut in the past might not have been appropriate for customers saying quite sensitive things um, 
about health or about the world, about the situation they're in. So um, I'm really pleased that the team put a lot of effort in from the start to make our voice assistant sound genuinely convincing um, and friendly and not robotic. Because when it came to customers saying sensitive things, then it was, we were already halfway there. Yeah, fair. Um, so I, I'm going to group some of these last questions into one final one, which is you you, you spoke a bit earlier about you know, the, the concept of the uncanny valley, right? So for people who aren't familiar, that's, you know, there's this sort of tipping point at which, um, you know, if it starts to sound or, or feel or, or look too human, um, I think the famous example is in movies or TV shows, then um, the audience or, or actually had starts to have an adverse reaction to that, um, to that character, right? And so um, where do you sit, Nathan, um, in terms of the voice assistant being as human as possible? Or, um, yeah, like, where, where, how do you tell, I guess, is probably the question. How do you tell that you've got it right? I mean, it's very hard. To tell um especially especially when we go to to new countries or new use cases it, it's hard but i think we don't um we want like everyone has phoned a call center agent who a real call center agent who has been maybe too friendly or too fake and maybe that's felt uncanny or they've been really rude and it's left us with a really like a really sour taste about the about the brand so we always say that we we build a virtual assistant to be as good or better than your best contact center agent. So the star in the contact center who all the customers love, like that's what, that's what we aspire to. And I think even if it sounds human, if it sounds human, but it's like a great contact center agent, then that's, that's never going to be off-putting. Great. Yeah, that's a great, um, great reference point, I think, for the audience to, to, to walk away with. Um, so yeah, I mean, thank, thanks everyone for, for joining us. Um, if you have any any questions or if you have sort of um, curiosities um, from from this presentation, I mean, feel free to to drop me a line personally at michael at, at polyai.com. Um, alternatively, um, you can obviously find more information about us uh, and, and our work at, at polyai.com. But yeah, um, I guess yeah, thank, thanks Nathan for for joining me for this session. Um, thank you and, for joining me. <laughs> And yeah, I guess uh, thanks everyone for joining and um, have a good, good evening.